You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now, here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Konnichiwa. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Issue 1, number 2, page 85. I am your host, your one and only host, Rish Outfield. Uh, and I'm the other guy. That's not a host anymore. That's Big right. Anklevich. Well, you screwed up just one time too many. Oh, really? Who I was... wasn't keeping track. Okay. There were, there were six times yesterday, two times the day before that, and then on Sunday you did fairly well one time. But that's eight. Uh-huh. I'm not very familiar with American sports, but I believe eight strikes <laughs> gets you sent to the penalty box. Okay. Makes sense. So today's story? Today's story is... Not on the Menu, by Derek L. Palmer. Derek Palmer is a naive farm boy who never had much adventure in his life. In fact, the most exciting thing that ever happened to him was going to the Tashi station to pick up power converters. But he's been writing stories since he was a wee lad. And he's been heard on the Drabblecast and on this very podcast. Not on the Menu, by Derek L. Palmer. My little girl was a mess. She'd fallen out of the tree out back. I thought only boys climbed trees. What kind of a kid was I raising? Broken two fingers, dislocated her arm, split her lip, lost a tooth, and required 11 stitches in her chin. Carrie was seven and tall for her age, but when I'd seen her there, stumbling around the backyard... She'd seemed a year old again, just taking awkward new steps, and very, very small. She'd been too hurt to cry at first. The crying came later, and lots of it. Trish was in bed when Carrie had fallen, but she'd had some kind of premonition. Either that or her hearing is much better than mine, because my wife started shouting for me. I'd been in the living room glued to sports center instead of getting my already overdue work done. Trish was eight months pregnant and had been having all sorts of complications, so I assumed it was her I should be worried about. But when I ran into the bedroom, she told me, sitting up in bed with a magazine propped over her big belly, that I needed to check on Carrie. I went to Carrie's room, which was empty except for a couple thousand stuffed animals, then down the hall, and ultimately to the kitchen where the big sliding door looked onto the backyard, and the lurching child with blood running down her pink t-shirt. I'd called her name, opened the door, asked what happened, then ran onto the grass, stepping in something foul I didn't notice until later, and grabbed her before she made a sound. Her face was already swelling, her arm was bent like Frankenstein's, her eyes were glassy, and her skin was as pale as, well, Dracula's, to keep the comparisons consistent. I'd scooped her into my arms, putting too much pressure on that knocked-about hand, and she began to howl. It was high-pitched and frightening, reminding me of a fire alarm. Trish had pulled herself out of bed, which had become increasingly difficult for her to do lately, and came into the kitchen just as I was bringing Carrie up the steps toward the door. She began to ask questions, teary, frightened ones, and I have to admit that I started getting scared there. I didn't have any answers, and knowing that made me feel small and useless. I nearly told her to shut up, both of them, really. But I got the child in the house and onto the kitchen table, where I laid her and she immediately cried out for her mommy. Trish had been ill for a while. She'd been having trouble with the baby, with the last three, in fact. And the doctor had told her to take it easy, to rest and store up her strength, so this one didn't go the way the others had. Carrie was an only child, and not for lack of trying. The doctor, a handsome young man who insisted on shaving his head so he looked older, had warned us that if this baby were miscarried, there probably wouldn't be any more chances. So Trish couldn't pick Carrie up. She did hug her, though, and tried her best to calm the girl down, who eventually stopped shrieking and began only to sob. She explained that she'd been climbing the tree, and she fell, and she hurt her hand, and it was scary, and it still hurt, and she wanted her mommy, even though mommy was standing right there. I recognized the dislocated arm from action movies, and considered trying to pop it back into place like the martial arts guys did, but one look at her actual shoulder, 
where there was a big bulge and purpling skin. Well, that changed my mind. I took Carrie to the car to drive her to the emergency room, and Trish hugged her goodbye, but then insisted on going back inside for her shoes and her purse. At least three minutes later, she came out of the house still barefoot, having changed her mind, but feeling terrible about it. She'll be fine, I promised, and looked down at my daughter, lying across the back seat, still seeming very small. And she was fine, more or less. We waited almost an hour and a half in the emergency room. Trish called me three times during the wait, certain I was avoiding telling her the bad news. But after a shot, a mouth rinse, a quick nap, an arm tug, and several stitches, she was back to normal. Okay, not normal, but I was able to take her home. She behaved herself throughout, and while I was afraid of the old, let's have a talk outside, while social services were called, there was never any implications that I was an abusive father. In fact, the doctor made a joke to me about Carrie's guardian angel having gone out for cigarettes that probably would have really offended the kind of parent that believed in angels. On the drive back, Carrie asked why she didn't get a cast on her arm, and I explained the difference between a dislocation and a break. And I'll be darned if she wasn't disappointed she wouldn't have a cast that her friends could paint and sign. Kids. I asked if she wanted to stop and get a milkshake or some fries, and she agreed, but not exuberantly. We hit the little mom-and-pop hamburger joint just past the freeway, the one that had been there since the caveman days. It was a cross between fast food and a real restaurant, and Trish and I used to eat there when it was just the two of us, also in the caveman days. Our waitress was named Rebecca, and she offered my daughter her share of sympathies before seating us at the corner booth. Carrie had been drugged before the doctor reset her arm, and she still seemed a little bit out of it. But she thanked the waitress for the menu and leafed through it to find the dessert section. I looked at my own menu and thought I'd get a chocolate malt. Sadly, they were $3.75. About the same price as a gallon of gasoline, but that didn't make me feel any better. What looks good, honey? I asked. Carrie was picking at her menu like a scab. I know that sounds strange, but there was a piece of masking tape on one of the plastic pages, and she was trying to remove it with her left hand. Her right one, of course, was in a sling, two of the fingers in splints. They covered up one of the flavors, she told me. I looked at my own menu. On that page, I could see no tape, but one of the flavors had been blacked out with a pen or sharpie. It looked like it might have been raspberry. Honey, what do you want? Maybe strawberry? Carrie gave it another few seconds and then said, Got it! You decided? I asked, though I saw she'd just gotten the tape off and was proud of this trivial accomplishment. She looked down at the menu. It was boysenberry, Daddy, she said, reading. Then she shrugged. What's boysenberry? It's a fruit, I said, then realized I had no idea what boysenberry tasted like. Maybe I've lived a sheltered life. What, sure, but what is it like? It sounds like boysenberry. They're probably out, Carrie, I said, seeing the waitress coming our way. She was an average-looking girl with curly black hair. When she got closer, I saw that her eyes were a shade of violet. It was unusual, and I considered asking if they were contacts. But of course they were, right? Nobody has violet eyes, do they? I must have lived a sheltered life. You all ready? She asked, and her voice was soft and sweet. I figured it was because of Carrie's bruised face and arm. Do you still have boysenberry? Carrie asked, and I almost told her to forget it. She wouldn't like boysenberry, and that word was starting to bother me, starting to sound like mispronounced nonsense. But the waitress stopped smiling at that question, and her mouth opened just a bit, like she'd been startled. She looked back behind her and exhaled. Then she was smiling again and looked back at us, professional as ever. You mean a milkshake, right? Did it say boysenberry on your menu? Mine's blacked out, I said. But Carrie turned her menu around and showed the woman. Boysenberry, she said. And I really wanted her to give it a rest. But when I looked at her, I couldn't quite get irritated. Like I said before, the girl was a mess. We, uh, probably have it. Rebecca, the waitress, said, looking nervous. But I'd better make sure. Is it a problem? I asked, wondering why she was acting so surprised. Sure, it had been marked out on both our menus, but why not just say it had been discontinued or something? No, I, um... She gave both of us a grin, then headed for the counter like a shot. I'll be right back. Boysenberry! Carrie said again. She put her uninjured hand over the word on the menu. How do you spell Boise? Like where Grandma lives? I spelled it for her. 
Maybe that's where the berry comes from, she speculated and unconsciously touched at her chin. How's it feel? I asked. It's numb still, she answered. It's gonna hurt a lot after, huh? I didn't know how to answer that. My first inclination was to lie, but that one would be found out really quick. Carrie seemed prepared for the pain to come, but I didn't want to give her more to worry over. The doctor said it would be sore, sure, but you'll be all right. I hope I don't have to, Carrie said. But then the waitress came out from the kitchen and headed our way. An older looking man, probably the owner, had come out with her. But he hung back and just watched, awaiting some kind of decision. Sorry about that, our waitress told us. We um do have boysenberry, but it's kind of a special flavor. There's not much of it left. Enough for a small shake? I asked. Well, yes, but what I mean is, it's kind of an expensive flavor. How much? Well... She paused and looked back at the owner, then back at us. Like, um, $18? I nearly stood up. $18 for a shake? You're joking, right? She considered her answer, then shrugged. Have you ordered it before? You know what I mean? No, never. But that's okay. We'll order something else. I looked at Carrie. What else looks good, honey? She didn't glance down at the menu. But I wanted to try boysenberry. How will I know if I like it if- You won't, I said. I could feel a headache coming on. Better order something you know you like. Eighteen bucks is a little expensive for a learning experience. Is it yucky? Carrie asked the waitress, and I had to smile at the word yucky. A very baby word, I thought. No, not at all. The woman said, and seemed nervous again. She tried to find an explanation, but nothing came. It's just, um, really special, I guess. I believe she just asked herself a question and then answered it. You wouldn't like it, I told my daughter again. All the little gold and nuggets and ground-up diamonds make it too hard to digest. Rebecca the waitress laughed, but it was a pity laugh. It was a laugh that said, I know I've been a bad waitress, but I'd really like a tip anyway, okay? Is $18 a lot? Carrie asked me. Is it more than 100 Honey, you know it's not more than 100 but it's more than 10 milkshakes should be. The other flavors are all 325 the waitress offered. Unless you want two flavors mixed, then it's 375 Her tip was heading for the door and would soon be hailing a cab. Could I have boysenberry in another flavor like vanilla? Carrie asked, totally unwilling to give up. The waitress tried to smile again, but wow, she was sweating bullets here. I think it would still be $18, but... She turned to face me instead of my daughter. Well, it might be worth it in this case, you know. No, I didn't know. I didn't know how they could charge nearly 20 bucks for a milkshake in the restaurant at the top of the Empire State Building, let alone a little roadside diner, even if it included a lap dance from a strange, stammering 20-something with purple eyes. It wouldn't be worth it. Sorry, honey, it's just too much. Is it all right if we order you something else? I expected Carrie to fight me on this, to whine or tell me it was no fair. Or worse, to just sit there and sulk, wishing all sorts of guilt and cooties on me. But she paused, looked at us two adults, then nodded her head. All right, she said. And I was proud of her. I studied her bandaged fingers, the arm which had been all lopsided just an hour or two before, the chipped bottom tooth, the top one knocked out completely. It had been a baby tooth, thank goodness, and would have fallen out eventually. The gash on her chin all sewn up now, and I was overcome with a tidal wave of affection and protective love for her at that moment. Maybe I can have black cherry instead, my girl said, pointing to it on the menu. It was three lines above boysenberry. You know what? I said, getting my wallet out. Boysenberry it is. We'll live dangerously. So I'd try to get in a little overtime tomorrow, so what? Carrie said... At the same time that the waitress said, If you're sure. And I smiled at them both. I think you'll be happy about it, mister. The waitress said and turned around to place the order. She nodded across the room to the owner and he appeared disappointed to see it. Then I remembered that I hadn't got to order my malt and I called the woman back to make my order too. It's still 375, right? I asked her. No gold dust on mine? (laughs) Right, no gold dust. The waitress said and she sounded relieved. It didn't take long for my malt to arrive, but an extra three minutes after that before Carrie got her shake. As soon as Rebecca the waitress set it down, I grabbed my daughter's spoon and served myself to the first taste. 
just so I could know what a $20 shake tastes like. Oh, and boysenberry too. Carrie didn't complain, and it was fairly good. Too sweet, sure, but all shakes are too sweet. It's part of the deal, like a fattening donut. But after I had swallowed it, I had a feeling of health and contentment, the way they said chocolate is supposed to make you feel. I drank down most of my malt, fairly sure I'd get an ice cream headache, but there was no pain. Even the impending headache from before hadn't arrived. Carrie said, Mmm! and alternated between spooning and strawing the shake into her mouth. It had better be good, I said, finishing my own glass. That's your first year of college going down right there. She ignored me, as well she should have. I had never been good at staying angry at Carrie, especially when she was sick or otherwise pitiful. And now, looking at her face, I was surprised to see that the swelling had already begun to go down. Either that or the light in this place made her look better than she had. My cell phone rang, and it was Trish again. I told her I wasn't sure I could afford to pay for milkshakes and my phone bill this month, and she had no idea what I was talking about. She asked how Carrie was, and I told her she seemed pretty all right. I asked how Trish was, and she paused just a moment too long before telling me she was all right, too. I told her I loved her, that we both did, and we'd be home soon and put the phone back on my belt. My child was drinking her shake voraciously, using both her hands by the time she was finishing it. I could see her eyes twinkling around the glass, and I felt like the beverage had almost been worth the price tag. When she finished downing it, I asked, How was it? And she wiped pink off her face and grinned at me. Delicious, she said, and a gasp escaped my lips. All her teeth were there, right where they should have been. Or rather, where they were before, but shouldn't have been anymore. What? Show me your mouth, I ordered. And she did. The tooth was back. Which was impossible. Sure, but there it was. And the chipped one? Yep, you guessed it. It was good as new. I reached for my cell phone again, though it hadn't rang. Someone came to the table then, and I thought it would be our waitress. But it was the man she'd been talking to before, the one I had assumed was the owner. How was your meal? He asked, pleasant as can be. Just dessert. Carrie said in that correcting way she had since she'd started school. The man was unfazed. How was your dessert? Delicious. She said again. I couldn't respond. I wasn't able to look at the owner for staring at my daughter. Carrie's chin looked like it had last night at dinner. No swelling, no discoloration, no evidence of any injury except the band-aid on her chin. How's your arm? I heard myself asking. Fine. She said. She was playing with her straw, balancing it on top of her glass. Your fingers? Good. I realized my mouth was open, like a dog with its head out a car window. I wanted to take Carrie's band-aid off right then and there, just to see. I even reached for the bandage, and the owner put his hand on my arm. It's not necessary, sir. You'll find the injury is gone. And I understood something. This was not a rare occurrence in this place. He knew this would happen. The waitress did, too. And that's why he'd come over to our table. It was the shake, I said, wasn't it? He didn't answer that one. Didn't even nod. I just wanted to come over and thank you for your purchase. And I wondered... The boysenberry. It did this, didn't it? The flavor. Yes, he said, and shifted nervously. Or maybe he just shifted, and I misinterpreted the movement. Which is why we have to charge so much. We've considered having new menus made without it on there, but I keep putting it off. Why? I asked, and changed my mind. No, how? How is it possible? I don't really... He started to say. Well, actually, I doubt if you'd believe me if I told you. I just wanted to come over and ask if you wouldn't mind keeping what happened here tonight a secret. Maybe just between you two. My wife, I said. She's going to know that something happened when I get the kid home and she sees she's not... Oh, oh, okay. He amended. Maybe just your immediate family. But we'd like to keep the boysenberry flavor a secret, just so word doesn't get out about its... special qualities. Carrie gasped then. I guess she just made the connection. It made me better. My fingers are unbroke now. The owner put his hands up as if to shush her and looked around the restaurant. No one was paying any attention to us, and the nearest occupied table had a couple of bored-looking teenagers who were building a pyramid with sugar packets. Please, don't let the word out. There really isn't much boysenberry left. Sure, I said, 
our secret. No big deal. But honestly, I couldn't wait to get home and tell Trish about it. And Allison at work, too. Then I thought about Trish. Her pregnancy. Pregnancies, plural. Can I get another one to go, please? Another shake? The owner asked, an overwhelmed expression on his face. It was like I had asked if he could donate maybe a little more kidney. Just one more. Boysenberry? Yes. Uh, You see, my wife is... Well, she's expecting, and she's been having complications, and I... Will it help her to have one, you know? I know, the owner said. I'm sure your wife will do much better with a shake in her stomach, yes. But I must ask you not to spread this around, and I will have to charge you $18 again. All right, I said, though I thought for sure he'd give it to me for free. You know, in return for my silence. Good enough, the man said. I'll have Becky bring your check. Thanks, I said, and watched him walk away. He said something to the waitress, and she let out a surprised laugh. I guess people didn't spend $40 on milkshakes very often. She said something else to him, and I distinctly heard the owner say, From now on, if anybody asks, it's $20, maybe 21 The waitress came over to tell us it would be just a minute, and as she went back to make it herself, I added, To go, please. Author's Note Believe it or not, this story started out as a mad scientist tale. I had the idea that a doctor sticks needles into the brains of several volunteers and then extracts the chemical produced by each one as he hands them a puppy. The endorphins produced were going to lead to all sorts of miraculous cures, including accidentally restoring the sight to a little blind girl. But I threw all of that out and decided to write a short story about a father and daughter A story that, for once, doesn't end with someone turning evil or the dead coming back to life. I'll let you decide whether it would have been better with The Mad Scientist. All the characters are named after girls I had crushes on in junior high and middle school. And even though I wrote the story just this year, I'm happy to say that the gas prices reference is no longer valid. $18, however, is still a lot to pay for a milkshake. Okay, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the story. If you did or didn't, go to the blog. Leave a post. Say what you thought. I like it when people post. I really do, too. I think it's great that John Smith goes on there and that he assumes all these other names Mm -hmm. and posts because, you know, it makes me feel warm inside. Yeah. It was really cool uh, a couple weeks ago when uh, John Smith got on there, and he went on and on. And uh, he, he disagreed all... with himself. Yeah, it was so... he yeah brought up other points that he hadn't thought of. Mm-hmm. Anyways, uh, so this is our last show uh, before the new year comes in. We'd like to wish you all a happy new year. Um, I, th- I thought this was our last show ever because <laughs> we had. I, I poured the cyanide cocktail right here. I <laughs> oh. drank half of mine already. And I thought that afterwards we were going to just, you know, toast and then be toast. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> luckily, I haven't drank any of mine yet because I was waiting until after the show. Oh. Announcer man, I, I, I don't feel so well. I, I believe he always dips in early, so you all right in there, announcer man? I don't I, even see him. I just, I see feet. Oh, dear. Poor announcer man. Sorry, that kind of sucked. It did. Can we edit the whole... Last six issues, please, R O eight T. Let's just wipe them out. I was going to say, website is www.doonsteef.com. Mm-hmm. If you have a story that you'd like to send for our perusal, then uh, how do they get that story to us? It's submissions at doonsteef.com. Submissions at what? Doonsteef.com. Can I take just a second out of our busy show and, and ask right. you a question uh-huh. you may know what I'm about to ask because you know I've, I've, I've tried to be building up the courage all this uh, listen a lot of people gone to prison before it was an accident okay I, I some friends egged me on and that's why I did it and you know what all of her hair grew back she walks normal now she's a school teacher okay it, big yeah I, I was going to ask you what Doonstief means. Oh, Doonstief. But wait, wait, wait. What was this thing about prison? 
I I don't know what you're talking about, man. Okay, so Dune Steve, what 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 does Dune Steve mean? That's an interesting story. Uh, once I had a dream. I was walking through a vast, warm field of sunflowers, and on the face of every flower was one of the cast members of Saved by the Bell. Um, it was a surreal dream. And it seemed to go on for hours with just me basking in the springtime air and interacting with my good, good friends. Finally, I, I knew somehow that it was time for me to leave as I turned to go, the sunflower with uh, Mr. Belding's face on it beamed at me, and he said, You have done well, my boy. If someday you ever have a son, you should name it Andrew. And if someday you ever do a podcast, you should name it Dune Steve. But, Big, your son is named Nigel. That's true. But, but what about the dream? Didn't you think that hey, maybe... It was just a dream. Why would I let something like that influence me? All right. Um, so, if, yeah, if, Dune Steve. If, Dune Steve. And on that website, there is a button. There's three buttons. There are three buttons. Yes, you can press them. And one of the buttons is cursed. <laughs> really? I didn't know that. I think I've pressed them all before. It's all right. No one else has. Uh, yes, these buttons are wonderful, magical buttons. You press them to donate to this podcast, to this audio fiction magazine, because we pay our writers, we pay them with money, and they can't be paid unless we get donations. So there's three different choices. You can donate just to any, any old sum you pull out of your head or out of your wallet or whatever. Or you can donate $5 a month or $5 a quarter. Since we're a quarterly magazine, we're about to start a new quarter. Our winter issue, where all the stories will be cold and bleak. Like my life. Yes. Play the sad music. It just, I look outside and, and there's, there's just gray everywhere. Okay. So Even the snow has... Moving on. Um, but, and, 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 I, and I fog up the glass. It's New Year's! Happy New Year's, everybody. And the streaks of my tears. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Happy New Year's, folks. That's right. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Uh, five seconds. Counting down. Five. I see the ball dropping. Oh, sorry. Zipper. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> so it's New Year's. And we finally silenced Rish so we can go on with the, the interesting part of the podcast. We were going to talk a little bit about what's coming up in the new year. Maybe some New Year's resolutions for our show. Do you have any resolutions for our show that you'd like to share with the good people out there, Rich Outfield? Sure. I can think of two. Uh, one is that I resolve in the new year to read more of the submissions instead of making you do it all. <laughs> that would be nice. Because I just cannot be arsed to read any of those darn submissions. Because often I let you do all the heavy lifting, which is fine, because you're all muscular and stuff. Really, I, I should have stopped a long time ago. 8 OT R 0 <laughs> Can you uh, edit out me getting your name wrong, and then when you're done with that, edit out all the dumb comments I've just made in, I don't know, the last 10 minutes. How long have we been recording? <laughs> Uh, yeah, he says, uh, just turn off your microphone and save us both the work. Ooh. And then the other resolution is, long, long ago, when man still walked on his knuckles, I wanted to do a dogs versus cats conversation. Mm -hmm. And I resolved that in 2009, we will do that. All right. Dogs versus cats. Coming to a show near you. Okay, so those are my two resolutions. Do you have any resolutions? Well, what I'd like to resolve in the next year, I'd like to do a lot more with the podcast. Like an all-musical episode? Is that what you mean? Uh, Does it have if, to be original music, or can it be like the tunes of something we already know, and I have to write new lyrics? Um, I think if we can find somebody that has some kind of talent in music to join our team, then maybe we can think about doing an all-musical episode. But for now, we're going to put that on the shelf. What I was actually uh, thinking is it would be cool. At the start of the podcast, we did about an episode a week. 
and then somewhere further into it, we were doing about an episode every 10 days. And, and now? For the last few weeks, we've been doing about an episode every two weeks. But, I mean, I don't know. I look at other people who do uh, similar shows to ours. They get an episode out every week. I don't know how they do it. My guess is that they have a larger team than just two people and an imaginary robot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. A real robot to, to take care of these things. So this is what I was going to say on our podcast here and now. I am going to make... A call, a petition, a plea out to anyone who is interested in becoming... Uh, I don't know what I'm saying here. I'm kind of... You, you're coming out of the closet. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Big Anklevich is finally... Uh, you know, I've suspected for a long time. And it's kind of just the way that you stand yeah. and cross your legs yeah. when standing. Which most people can't do unless they're leaning against... Wait, that's not what you were talking about? No. The look you're giving me. <laughs> oh, is this a come on? See, I'm not coming out. I'm just going to... You're going to stay in the closet? Yeah, whatever. No, uh, actually, I was going to uh, make a call out to anybody who is interested in joining the Steve team. There's a lot of things that, you know, we could use some help on. You know, I mean, basically, we run a fiction market. I don't know. I always thought it was neat, the idea of getting a story published in a magazine or something like that. And that's basically what we are. We may be getting by by the skin of our teeth so far but there's no reason that we can't get better in the future yeah so if you're interested in joining the dune steve team there's several things that uh, you know we could use help with be somewhat difficult to add on more and more hosts because you know, we actually do this thing in the same room and so unless you happen to live in the same town as us we're kind of out of luck on that plus you're always farting Oh, yeah, that's true. You wouldn't want to be here. But we get a lot of submissions from various authors around the world. And these submissions need to be read and evaluated. So far, it's just us doing it. And Come on, per, you can, you can be, admit it. It's as, just you doing as it. As per Rish's uh, resolution, it's just me doing it. So we could really use some help if you're interested in, in that part of uh, the operation. You could be uh, one of our readers, one of our editorial staff. You could be co-editor, just like Kendall Marchman or Luke Coddington. Another way that uh, they could help out is, uh, is by maybe reading parts. That's Ca right. Stories when we have several characters. I, it was great. Uh, we had Starship Sofa asked us to read some stuff. Drabblecast, as you know, had us do some voices just uh, a couple weeks ago. That's right. And we did manage to get a couple people to read stories for us. We got Cameron and Jacinta to read that uh, story by Rick Kennett, the... Uh, Seas of Castle Hill Road. We could always use more voices. It's, it's, especially if you're female or right. if... Because uh, Rish and I, it turns out, are both not female. Well, not 100% yet. <laughs> Yeah, if you have accents or, 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 or anything. Yeah, or you can do accents. Like the last story we haven't done yet, your eight-year-old son did the voice of grandpa. And I just, I'm not sure that that's the best way to go, but it's all we've got. Yeah, well. Also, if you're interested in more in the production side of things, if you're uh, not interested in being on the show, but you are interested in helping with the show, there's also a lot of editing that needs to be done. Uh, there's a free program out there that you can download. It's called Audacity, and and that's what Rish edits with. Yes, it, the, the, the podcast you're hearing right now where I just said the F word, Audacity. Yeah, see that? See the magic of editing? <laughs> Tell you the truth, if you wanted to do all three things, be a voice, read stories, and edit, you can volunteer for them all. Here's a fourth. Oh. If you're artistic... Oh, right. We could use uh, like drawings or painting or you know some kind of visual stuff on the website. Not that the logo that that Big created <laughs> is not cool. It's cool, but uh, we wanted it to be kind of like a real magazine with a cover and maybe a couple of illustrations as you go th as you go through. Yes. <laughs> Good. Where's your audacity now, Moses? See, we wanted it to be visual as well as as odd deal. Odd, odd Oral. No, thanks. Oral. Well, we, we just wanted the, the website to be a little more visual and to have an, well, not an actual 
magazine, but to have something resembling a, a magazine on there that you could look at. Yeah, you can have like a cover art and maybe some other little art that could go along with the, the various stories. But uh, yeah, if you're an artist and you'd like to get some of your art out somewhere where people could see it, there are occasions where people actually do visit our website, mostly because they're lost. But if you do any of those things, we'd love to have some help. I, I think it'd be really cool to be able to grow the Dunes Deep Audio magazine into something uh, a little more fancy, special, cool. And with more stories, too. And I think we're so backlogged on stories. Yeah, seriously. Uh, where we've, we've told people that we would do them. There was a Michael Stone story that we accepted back in, like, the Nixon administration. And uh, it still hasn't seen the light of day. That, yeah, we accepted... Uh, Many stories that I meant to have in our fall issue. There was a brand new Dickens story that hadn't <laughs> been published with that behind. Yeah, they're, they're, they've been pushed now to the winter issue. And if we don't get our act together, perhaps the spring issue as well. We'd really like to be able to uh, expand it. We could stop being a quarterly magazine and be a monthly magazine instead. Or How would you pay the people? Uh, that would be donations, hopefully. So those are my resolutions for the uh, podcast. So here's me trying, try number one. Please join our team. Yeah, we're that scrappy bunch of misfits that got kicked off every other team and we found each other, pulled it together, and we're almost able to win the pennant. All right, so we're just going to call it a night then. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Uh, I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. It's not enough to bash in heads. You've got to bash in minds. See you later, folks. Have a wonderful new year. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. <laughs>